good. So welcome, everyone. Um, I hope you had a nice Queen's Day, and those of you who were at the conference last week enjoyed it. But I also hope you caught up with the content. Um, first, some quick uh, organizational remarks. I hope you all know this already, because I posted it yesterday on the website. And if not, be reminded that I use the website to make also important announcements, sometimes also last minute announcements. So make sure to have a regular to regularly have a look at there. And if you did, then you already know this, then uh, you already know that the second assignment is online now. And it, since it is much more work than the first one, I also recommend to have a look at it soon. And there will be, <clears throat> like we always have, a little introduction talk from the TAs for this second assignment, where they will talk about it at a little more from a higher level to give you a better a general overview and a better and easier start with it. Um, it is not mandatory that you go there, but very, very highly recommended. We will also not record this talk, so uh, you either go there or you miss it. Um, unfortunately, because of the previous and the upcoming holiday next Thursday, we're running a little low on uh, lecture dates, which is why I couldn't stick it into a lecture this year. We tried all kind of possibilities and the best we could come up with is to basically just make it directly after the lecture, but because that conflicts, of course, with the practicals and the tutorial sessions, we are having two talks this year. So it's basically one talk given twice. So um, you still have a chance or you don't have an excuse not to go to the tutorials, let's say that way. And the practical sessions with the TAs will then be uh, most likely be extended. I just cannot announce it officially yet because I need to wait for the confirmation from the TAs because, of course, it's also not in their regular time schedule. So uh, I have to uh, wait for their uh, confirmation. Good, but as I said, the information is also on the website. So make sure uh, to mark your calendars next week and the following week, Tuesdays after the lecture. There is this introduction talk for the practicals, which is very highly recommended. So you can have a look at them now. And if you look at them and you say, this is all easy, I all know that, okay, then uh, you can probably skip it. But otherwise, I really recommend that you go there. Good. So uh, let's start with the, or continue with the, the mathematical basics for computer graphics that we started last week. And since there was a longer break in between, let's just start with a little recap. We started by introducing this uh, vectors concept to describe points in a 2D or 3D space that we want to, of course, then draw on our screen to make some nice graphics. So we, we, define, we introduced this vector concept as uh, we defined this as just an n-tuple of scalar values and sorted n-tuple of scalar values, of course, in 2D. Those are two values. In 3D, those are three values. Um, alternatively, we could define a vector by its length and its direction, which becomes clearer if you look at the geometric interpretation that we have on the image here on the right side that we see. We can use uh, illustrate it basically as an arrow, but we also see that um, there is uh, like this this geometric interpretation of it is also related and very often to a specific point or a specific location. So we're using the vectors to describe points and locations, but it's important to keep in mind that vectors are not locations, but they're an abstract concept that we can use to describe certain things. And that's especially important, of course, when we want to do arithmetics with it, which was then the next step that we did. We identified simple vector arithmetic, which was addition, multiplication with a scale, and multiplication with a scalar value. And especially for the addition, we see See this notion of this abstract concept because addition from an algebraic way it's just straightforward uh, addition of two scalar values because we just do a pairwise sum of the two uh, coordinates of the of the matching coordinates of two vectors but if we look at a geometric interpretation and we see it can interpret this basically as just taking the one vector and appending it to the end of the other vector. And then we get the sum of these two vectors, which matches the algebraic interpretation. But from the image, we see then, of course, the vector w is now the same vector that we had before when it started from the origin. But it, it looks in the image as, it is, is, as if it is a different vector, which it's not a different vector. It's the same vector, but it, of course, describes a different location. Good. So this is a little uh, an, 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 uh, yeah, abstract uh, uh, specification of it that uh, hopefully over the, uh, of the run of the course, when you do more work with it, it will become more clear and more uh, you will deal with it uh, uh, more intuitively. 
Um, and then we've seen that we can use the scalar multiplication and the addition of vectors to describe and create other vectors. I didn't explicitly introduce the notion of linear combination by writing it down that way, but it is, of course, obviously clear that this works, that we can create vectors by combining scalar multiplication and addition or subtraction to create new vectors. But what I did explicitly introduce was the notion of so-called uh, linear combinations of linearly independent vectors. Linearly independent vectors were vectors that are not parallel, so that have, when you draw them next to each other, that have an angle in between. Um, <coughs> that is not zero or 180 degrees. And um, because those are very important, because then we can not only create one vector, but we can basically describe all vectors in our vector space. We just need if we have a two-dimensional vector, we need two linearly independent vectors. If we have a three-dimensional space, we need three in linearly independent vectors. And then with the linear combination of it and the scalar multiple of these base vectors, these so-called base vectors, we can create any kind of vector that uh, uh, is in our 2D or 3D space. And then we introduce also the notion of a so-called orthonormal basis, which is a specific case, a special case where we have where those linearly independent vectors have a right angle and also are unit vectors. That means they have the length of one because that makes the calculation much easier. And we will see a lot of uh, examples of this already today uh, in this lecture. Good. And then we continued to a more um, a little more advanced uh, vector arithmetics and introduced the multiplication of two vectors. Now, there are different ways to define this, and one of them was the so-called Scott dot product or scalar product. The other one was the cross product. The result of the dot product is a scalar value, which is why it's often also called scalar product. The result of the cross product is another vector, and the correct, one of the major characteristics of this vector and why the cross product is so important in graphics is that this vector is perpendicular to the original vectors that we use when we do this multiplication, this cross product multiplication. Now, the dot product has an, also an interesting and important characteristic, which is that it relates to the length of the vectors and the cosine of the angle between the two vectors, which is also in, in relation to perpendicular vectors important, because then, of course, uh, the, uh, the cosine becomes zero. And uh, also, if we have unit vectors, of course, the length of the vectors is one. So we see that really the dot product relates directly to the cosine uh, of the angle between the vectors. Now, uh, like I said, we can use the cross product to create a vector that is perpendicular to two other vectors, and we will see later in the lecture an example when we talk about shading and light calculation, why this is important, why we often need these kind of vectors, these so-called normal vectors, normal vector because it's perpendicular to the other vectors. But of course, we also sometimes want to have a normal vector in 2D, and here the dot product actually comes in quite handy to figure out how does a normal vector in 2D look like. And this is a slide I had in the slide set previous time, but last time, but I didn't uh, uh, talk about it. Um, so uh, here it is now. Um, we, uh, we have a vector of a uh, describing a point in our 2D space, PXY with x and y coordinate, and now we want to have a vector that is perpendicular to it. Now we know if the vector is perpendicular, the scalar product must be zero. So if the scalar product is zero, so if we write down the scalar product of a vector with variables n x and y, and of course I call them n because it's supposed to be the normal vector, then we know if it's perpendicular, this scalar product must be zero. Now if we look at this equation, these values are the ones that we want to find. X and Y are given. It is obvious that the only two solutions we have to this equation that makes this, make this equation fulfilled, that is equal to zero, is Y and minus X or minus Y and X. Um, if you fill it in the equation, you see obviously that this is the case. You will also see that it is um, uh, that there are no, no other solutions to this, other, of course, than the trivial case 0, 0, which is the null vector, which is not a normal vector because the null vector is the only vector that doesn't have a direction. It only has a length, which is 0, but no direction. So we cannot use it as a normal vector because it is not, if it doesn't have a direction, it cannot be perpendicular to anything. So this is the only solution, which is technically not that correct, and that was actually a mistake on the last slide, or not a mistake, but it was uh, missing. 
I also have a scalar value lambda here. And that is, of course, um, we had this in relation to the specification of the line. I already said if you have an equation that equals zero, you can, of course, multiply that equation with any constant value lambda. And the equation is still fulfilled because on the right side, you get zero times lambda, which is still zero. And on the other side, you just get lambda times each of the values that is there. And then, of course, we will see that not only y and minus x is a, so is a normal vector, but also lambda times x and minus x is a normal vector. And from the geometric interpretation, this is also clear. These are then the vectors that point in the same direction, but just have a different length. But these are all vectors that are, of course, perpendicular. Good. So, uh, oh yeah, this is just for completion um, that I hope you realized based uh, when, when we did all this last time that we also kind of indirectly repeated certain basic stuff from mathematics that I hope you are all familiar with. If you have problems with that, then make sure that you refresh your memory and that you uh, look up some, some references on this. So, um, because this is, these are the basic things that we are going to use in the course, even if I'm not explicitly introducing it all the time. Good. So now that we have this, this basic framework in place uh, that we can use to describe certain kind of points in space, but also, of course, certain more advanced objects, or advanced is uh, not correct term here, it's basically, I often call it basic geometric entities, because we're really, in this course, at least only dealing with very simple geometric shapes. Um, and we started by these so-called, and, and there are, of course, different ways to represent those uh, objects in a space with this vector uh, concept or vector notation that we have now. And one of them are these so-called implicit curves that are in general characterized by we're defining a function from the two values that we have in our 2D space. So, so far we're only talking about 2D, we'll later then go to the 3D case. Um, we take the two coordinates and then we define a function and we say if that function has uh, a value of zero, then the point is on the curve. If it has a value that is unequal to zero, then it is not on the curve. And we had this uh, intuitive uh, geographic, uh, geometric interpretation of it that we say it's like a landscape and then everything in this particular plane is then the curve. So if we just look at this plane, we see that this is actually that we can draw here a little nice curve here. And then we had the example of a circle and a line that hopefully made this abstract representation a little clearer, and I will uh, repeat them later in when I uh, c compare them to the second uh, visual, uh, the second representation that we ha already started a little bit last time and that I want to finish now. Good. So this uh, second uh, representation is like last time I said that this, uh, or, or the, 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 the implicit representation I said is something where we can very easily verify if a point is on a certain object or part of a certain object, but it is not really that intuitive or that straightforward to construct or draw an object. And for that, the parametric uh, representation is much more suitable, which is basically we take the coordinates, and then for each coordinate we specify a function that calculates this value based on one parameter. So one of the characteristics of a parametric equation in 2D is that it is controlled by one parameter, which is one parameter less than the actual dimension. And you can think about this in an abstract way in this representation, for example, as an index that walks along this curve. And by increasing or decreasing this index, you basically go forward or backward along that curve, which hopefully became clear when we then were looking at the lines. So this is, again, uh, still just uh, the repetition of last time. Um, this was um, like. Uh, we, we, we said that intuitively we, it, it's clear that we can define a line uniquely in a space by just specifying two points on the line. And then if we draw the line and continue to infinity in both directions, we know that this is a unique specification, a unique de definition of a line. But of course, then we just have the two points to define it, but we need also a way to calculate the points on the line. And that was then, uh, hopefully, with this uh, representation becomes then clearer how this works. We have a support vector, which basically gives us a position in our space where the line has to go through. 
and then we have a direction vector that gives us the orientation of the line in our space and then by multiplying this direction vector with a scalar value t we can modify the length of the direction vector so again remember scalar multiplication modifies the length of a vector but it doesn't change the direction with the only one exception of course the reversal of the direction so if t is smaller than zero we go in this direction here we have t equals zero and t is larger than zero we go in that direction so by modifying t we can basically walk along this line or draw all the lines or calculate all the lines that are on the line good so we have this and like i said the major difference between the parametric representation and the implicit representation is that uh, or not not the major difference but the major like intuitive uh, uh, difference of it is that the implicit representation allows you to very easily verify if a point is on a line, whereas the parametric representation is usually more uh, suitable for calculating the points that are on a line. And uh, we will see later, then on, later on in the course why, this is, uh, why there are certain situations where a different representation might be more suitable and more easier to handle which is of course also why it is important to be able to switch between different representations and this is something uh, then uh, that I uh, mentioned already at the end last time but I didn't go into the details because I said this is something that you should also do as part of the tutorial because it's also a good exercise for you and a good training to understand the characteristics of these representations how to do this transformation and it is actually very simple if you remember or understand what are the unique characteristics that we use to describe these geometric objects. For example, for a parametric representation, there are two points that then define the two vectors that we need for this representation. For the implicit representation, it is a point on the line and then the normal, which gives the orientation of the, li of the line in our space. And for the slope-intercept form, of course, it's the slope and the interception with the y-axis. And that should basically give it away how you calculate it. So for example, if you have, if you want a parametric rep representation, you just calculate two points that are on a line and then you get the two, uh, you can create the parametric representation uh, and the same for the others. Good. So uh, for the uh, Implicit case, we talked about lines and circles. Of course, there is also a parametric representation of a circle. And uh, so we basically, so what we need is we need two functions that calculate us the x and y value of all the points that are on the circle. And I'm claiming that this function here, or these two functions here, are exactly what we want. And of course, this is uh, kind of like in the implicit case also when I put it on the board and then you uh, I said, okay, this is, uh, uh, this is it, and uh, then the, the question is, of course, how could we see that, or is it really, really correct? And in this case, we can see it actually quite simple. If we remember tr uh, trigonometry, it's just also uh, for the people who are, have difficulties remembering that or didn't have it that much in school uh, as a repetition, I put it here. These are the trigonomic relationships that we have in a triangle, and of course, if we look at the vector in a Cartesian coordinate system, that is a coordinate system where we have a right angle between the bases, then we see that this triangle, the, the coordinates of the vector make actually uh, the sides of a triangle at the right angle, and the opposite side is then the length of this uh, vector, and that way we see that we have for the cosine and for the sine this condition here with the length of the vector and the x and the y coordinate. Now if we put this into here for the cosine and the sine, then we see that this is indeed this x and the y value if we have it around zero and this set here comes from of course when we want to draw a circle here we have to add it here so this is basically do I not have an image here? No. Oh, I forgot to do that. Um, with this here we can describe a point and then we have an angle and then 
when we want to have a circle that is around a different center, of course, we just add this vector c to it, and then we can describe the point here. And um, this is the, the point where, where, I have, where I put the image, because I want to illustrate it, uh, compare it to an implicit representation, um, because there is this, this important difference that often confuses people. If we think about the implicit representation, we had we subtracted the center, whereas here we are at the center. But this is exactly because of this different characteristic of why we are using these different representations. With the implicit representation, we argued we have this equation, and, that, and then we have this point P here, and then we want to know, is this point P on the circle or not? And then we argued it is on the circle exactly if this vector here has the length r, or if this vector here, minus c, has the length r. So a point is on a circle, uh, on a circle around the center c, if it is on, the same cir on a circle with the same radius, of a point around the origin, which is exactly uh, a circle around the origin, which is exactly the circle that we get when we subtract c here. Now, for the parametric representation, we argued the other way around. We wanted to construct the circle, so we said we have a point here. If we have a, po uh, a circle around the, the origin, then we can use that here to describe each point here. And then let's call it P0 to distinguish it from this P here. And then if we say now we want to have a, a circle that is not around the origin, but around the center C, then of course we have to add this vector here. And then we end up here at this point. Oh, it's really badly drawn, but you get the idea. This is then the point P, which is P, uh, P0 plus C. And that is, of course, then here. This is our P0, and this is our vector C. So you see it is confusing if you look at it uh, separately, but if you have this intuition in mind that the one is mostly used to verify if a point is online, the other is on, a, on an object, the other is to create it, then it kind of becomes clear from the illustration. Good. Yeah. Um, another thing I would like to mention with relation to this parametric equation, like I said, you, for a parametric equation, we always have one value less than we have actual dimension to create this object. So we've seen for the line, we had this value t that allowed us to walk along all the lines on this, on the, uh, to, to, to walk along the line and to get all the points on the line. And here for the circle, of course, we don't have a value t, but we have an angle because the angle from zero to 360 degree also allows us to draw and to go to all points on the circle. And you will see later when we come to 3D why I'm mentioning this. Good. All right, yeah, when we come to 3D. Here we come to 3D. <coughs> so, uh, of course, we started with 2D because 2D is easier to explain, it's easier to draw, and of course, also in graphics, 2D is important. But we really want to do, of course, nice uh, and really cool uh, looking 3D graphics. So, um, <coughs> um, but fortunately, the, the 3D case, it's harder to draw, but it's uh, actually very simple generalization of the 2D case. So if you understood the 2D, you shouldn't have any problems understanding the 3D. So let's start with the implicit case where we basically just need a third coordinate here. So instead of having a function with two coordinate values, we have a function with three values. So this is really just a straightforward generalization from two to three coordinates. It is, of course, not straightforward when you'd want to draw it, because then I would need to draw a function from three values to a fourth value, and I cannot draw four dimensions. So the image here is the same still for the 2D case, but from the arithmetic, it should be clear that this is really just adding another coordinate. Hopefully, this becomes clear when you look at the concrete case of a sphere, where if you, oops, if you look at this is exactly what we had for the 2D case. So the only thing that is new now is this third coordinate, which um, we can make this clear to ourselves intuitively in the same way as, it with the, as we did it with the 2D case, where we said a point P is on the circle, or in this case, on the surface of the sphere, 
if and only if the length of the vector between this point and the center is exactly the radius of the circle or the sphere in that case. And um, the length of the vector is defined by this uh, uh, we, we can write this with, with the dot product, uh, or uh, yeah, the dot product is just one way to write it. The, the, uh, um, and then if we use the, because, yeah, no, sorry, the dot product is used here to do the arithmetic because then uh, with the length we have the square root, and with the dot product we get the square root out. So if we write it down and then uh, write it down with the dot product and then multiply this out, you will see that this we get exactly these this representation here, this equation here. So this intuitive um, specification that we set a point is on the sphere if the radius is the same size as the difference between the point and, this, uh, uh, and, this, uh, and the center of the sphere, then uh, we can do the arithmetic and we will come up with this equation. So I didn't write it down here because it's really very simple, straightforward uh, arithmetics, but I really recommend that, uh, especially if you are having problems with these kind of things that you use this also as an exercise that you do this at home even if I'm not explicitly writing it down here um, because a lot of times in the, in the ex exams I see that people have really problems with that and if you have problems with the very simple arithmetics um, then uh, then you will like lose a lot of points in the exam just for, for uh, stupid reasons so really it's important that you practice this also because uh, it's not really difficult and if you look at it it's very very simple but a lot of people make a lot of mistakes then when they actually do it so it's also important that you do not just look at it and say okay I understand it but also uh, you need some practice. Good so um, we, uh, we know now how we can go from a circle to a sphere in 3D, but also, of course, we want to generalize a line in 3D. Um, or we, 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 of course, we also want to draw lines in 3D, which we will do later. But um, we also want to have a generalization of a, a, a line in 3D, which could then be seen as a plane. So in a 3D space, we can describe, or we want to describe a plane with an implicit equation. And again, this is just a straightforward generalization of the 2D case with the line. So if you remember in the line for the 2D case, we had our coordinate system and we had a line which was defined by a vector P0 that we have here. And then we said a vector is on the line P vector p is on the line if and only if its product, uh, the scalar product with a normal vector to that line equals zero. And then we came up with this equation. The other way to come up with this was with the slope intercept form, which led then to this representation here, which uh, hopefully you see if you write abc as a normal, as a vector is exactly the same. Um, Again, we have already seen that in a 2D case, and here it's just an additional coordinate, but it is really exactly uh, the, the same way also how to show how to go from one form to the other. Um, but of course, we cannot do it here with a slope-intercept form because there is no such thing. Uh, the, the slope is not defined in a 3D space as it is in a, in a 2D case, but we see that this is exactly the same situation. So here, in a 2D case, I started with this one, and then Came, ended up uh, with the vector representation here. I start with the vector representation and then end up with the other one. So it's explained a different way around, again, because there is no slope of the plane in, uh, in 3D like there is in 2D, but it is uh, it basically leads to the very same two equations. And intuitively, from a geographic, a geometric point of view, we can also uh, intuitively imagine this as having a position of a plane in space, similarly to, I said, like I said, a position of a line in a space, and then we need, in 2D, we need a second vector, a direction vector, to specify the direction of the line, the orientation of the line, and in 3D we have then a normal vector that specifies the orientation of the line. Good. Um, yeah, now if you look at this, um, at this uh, representation at the top, we have here this uh, plus d. Of course, here for p0, it's clear for p0, it's just a point p0 that is on the plane that specifies the location of the, the uh, uh, absolute position of our plane in our space. But for this here, the vector value d, if you remember in the 2D case, 
we had it in this way. And this was actually the, the example where I said we had this before, that we have an equation if we multiply it with a constant value, then uh, it's still, the equation is still fulfilled because it equals zero and zero times the constant value is still zero. <coughs> which is why if we write it in that, we, it's often written in that way and not in a general form, which would be ax plus y, uh, by uh, plus c equals zero. Sorry. It's very difficult to write here at the bottom. Um, yeah, just look it up. Um, but yeah, yeah, I hope you remember it. It's uh, the general form, but we can transform it that way. And then, of course, uh, we often do this because then C just illustrates, the di uh, gives us the distance of the line from, on the, uh, uh, from the origin on the y-axis. And that's the same in 3D, only since I used the general form here where we don't have a one here and I had the plus here instead of a minus, it is minus d divided by uh, c that gives us here this distance. So if we want to write this as a vector, we can also write it as zero, zero minus d divided by c. Although of course we could use any vector on the line for p0 as I did here, where I just have drawn a random vector pointing to a random point on the line, uh, on the plane, sorry. Good. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so those are the implicit representation in 3D, and you see it's just a straightforward generalization to, uh, from 2D. And in the same way, also, the parametric surfaces are a general, just straightforward generalization of the 2D case. And like I said, in general, with the parametric representation, one of the characteristics is that we need one value less than we have dimensions to describe the points on the surface. So in one, in 2D, we need to have one variable. In 3D, we have two variables, so x and uh, u and v in this case, which is also intuitively kind of clear if we have a 2D space. And then we, ha one index is enough to walk along, to follow this curve and then list all the points. Whereas in 3D, of course, uh, one index wouldn't be enough to, to specify them all. So um, let's look at the, the sphere, which is, uh, seems a little more confusing than the 2D case. The 2D case was relatively easy to understand if you know the trigonomic relationships of a triangle, but the 3D is actually just a straightforward generalization. If we just had one angle in 3D, we could of course describe a circle like we do in a in a 2D case, but we cannot go up in the other direction. But what we, so what we do is we basically just add a second angle. So we use one angle to describe the location of the point in a plane through the sphere, and then we use a second angle to describe it in another plane in a sphere. And if the planes both go through the origin, then we will be able to access all points on the surface of the sphere. And this is actually something I'm pretty sure most of you or all of you have used before, not in this context, but it's basically how you describe maps by longitude, uh, locations on the maps by the longitude and the latitude, because the map is from the globe, which is a sphere. And then we also have two values to describe all points on a 3D object, which is the globe, but with just two parameters, which is a longitude and a latitude, which translates to these angles. Now again, of course, the question is, why are these values here correct? And this is something that I would also like to leave as an exercise, but I have drawn this image here that should clearly illustrate it, and I actually already gave the solution for the first coordinate away, because if we look at the image, we see that the cosine is x divided by I called it here D for distance because I couldn't come up with a different, uh, better, better name for it. But it's basically just this uh, value of this projection of the of the vector to to this x y plane. Um, be careful here. I realized this afterwards, so I didn't want to change it because I was afraid that I use its the notation somewhere else. These are uppercase letters, and these here are lowercase letters. In general, you should be careful with the with the uh, graph, the, the all the images, because I, I'm redoing them this year, because I realized last year that there are certain. Uh, I, I had the impression I can do can improve them to make make it better to understand, and I hope that works. But it's always when you do something completely new from scratch, 
you always end up having a few minor typos or mistakes in there, so be careful with the, the notation with the images. Um, but hopefully they, they are better now <laughs> than last year, and they, they help you in understanding the, the content better. Um, so here, this is uh, something that is not really cleverly chosen. This is a slow, a lowercase x indicating the coordinate of this point, and this is the uppercase x indicating the x coordinate, the x coordinate value. And you need that, of course, to know that this is x, and then you see, for example, that the, cos, uh, that the sine is defined like this, and the cosine is defined like this. Now, if you put that in the equation, you will see that it actually leads indeed to x because all the other values are evening, evening out each other. And then uh, you have proven that this is indeed the correct description of this, of this coordinate. And the same way you can do it for y and z. And like I said, it's a very good exercise to repeat the trigonomic, uh, trigonometric relationships in a triangle. Good. And uh, yeah. I wrote it as a question here, but I already gave the answer away by drawing the image next to it. That was also very clever. Um, so it's the same as in a 2D case. If we want to have a circle, a sphere that is not around the origin, but at a random point C in the, in the space, then of course we can say a point P is on the sphere here. Or if we want to construct a point P here, we can do that by constructing a point on, a, on the same sphere around the origin and then just adding the vector c to it, and then we end up with this point here at the sphere. And that's, of course, why when we want to draw the, uh, write down the equation, we have this additional factor here, which, again, is just a straightforward generalization of the 2D case. This here is also a generalization of the 2D case, but it's not, really, not that straightforward because we need a second angle here. Good. Yeah, and of course, um, if you look at this equation, it doesn't really, like in a 2D case, I would say the parametric equation might look a little more intuitive than the implicit representation, especially for the line. But for the sphere, um, the 3D case doesn't really look that intuitive because at least I, when I look at this or I saw this first, I didn't really, I wouldn't really have uh, guessed that this represents a sphere. But uh, we will see later why we're using it and where it is very useful and uh, will be very handy. Good. All right, the, um, yeah, the parametric representation of a plane is also kind of a straightforward generalization of the 2D case, but now, uh, in the same way as we needed two angles to describe the points on a sphere, we now need two vectors to describe the points on a plane instead of a line, because for a line, of course, we only have one vector that allows us to go along all the lines here. But in a plane, of course, the plane is basically a 2D subspace of 3D. So we have, with just one vector, we can only walk in one direction or the opposite direction on the plane, but we cannot walk along the plane or go to all the points that are on the plane in the, in the whole space. But we know from coordinate system, when we set the linear combination of two vectors that are not perpendicular to each other, we can create all vectors with those as linear combinations of those, and that is basically exactly what we use here. We have a linear combination of two vectors that are on the plane and that are not perpendicular to each other, so that's important here, and linearly independent. And then we can use these two vectors to create all points on the line. So we basically have here a coordinate system that starts at this position P0, which specifies the absolute location or one point, one absolute po uh, point uh, uh, in our space that the plane has to go through. And then the other two vectors specify the orientation in the same way as the line specified, the, the direction vector specified the orientation of the line in a 2D case. And um, yeah, this is of course, um, if we have three points in the same way as in 2D case where we have two points that specify the uh, that def can def use, be used to define a line. We can use three points in 3D to specify the plane, uh, uh, plane. We just need to make sure that the three points are not on a line, which would then be result in vectors that are parallel. And like I said, they have to be, obviously, they have to be linearly independent. Um, now, if we have these three points here, like if this is P1 and this is P0, then, of course, the equation can be is like this. Um, 
be careful here, I have just drawn this here as the intersection points with the coordinate axis because uh, the image was then easier to, uh, to understand, I think, because of course it's not that easy to draw uh, an infinite 2D object in 3D, so you have to use some tricks here, but you can use any points on uh, any three points in space to specify this plane. You just have to be careful here that this here is the support vector that is a point on the plane, whereas these two vectors here are of course vectors that are on the plane, so if you use the points that define the plane, you have to use the difference between them because those are the vectors that are on the plane and not uh, uh, the, the others, the others just point are points on the plane. It's a very, very common mistake in exams, unfortunately. Good. Um, yeah. So, um, <coughs> so these are the, the like the, the the generalizations from two D to three D. So from a circle to a sphere and from a line to a plane, but of course we also have, pl uh, for example, lines in 3D or other kind of curves in 3D, like a random curve or a circle in 3D that we want to represent. Um, unfortunately, we cannot do this with an implicit representation. Of course, we can write it down, but we will not be able to describe any object in that way with an implicit representation. What we can do is we can to use the intersection of objects presented in implicit uh, representation. We will see another example next week where we have uh, the intersection of two planes that leads then to a line in 3D, but it is not possible to for, for all objects to specify an implicit representation of it in 3D. No, sorry, it's not possible for all curves to specify uh, uh, implicit representation in 3D, but fortunately it is possible with a parametric representation because what we basically need is just three functions that depend on one single value that calculate our coordinates and of course the most obvious example of this is the line where we basically have the, the functions are then just uh, the sx plus t dx value and I called them s and d these two vectors because they are of course the same as the support and direction vector that we had in 2d so um, <coughs> again the geometric uh, interpretation of it or the visualization of it should make it very clear. We have one point that points in space that gives us an absolute location of our line. And then we need another vector that gives us the direction. And when we have that, we can just modify the length of this direction vector and then we can go to all the points on the line in our 3D space. That's also a good example why it's good to come here to the lecture and not just listen to the recording. Because people who hear this now and don't see it I have no clue what I just did. Good. Um, it is also uh, actually a nice illustration why we cannot make an implicit equation of a plane in, uh, sorry, of a line in 3D, because of course we can say when we have this vector here, we create a normal vector by creating a vector that is perpendicular to that. But of course there are not just like with a plane two vectors pointing in two directions, but there is an infinite amount of vectors, namely all vectors that are on this plane here that is perpendicular to the direction vector d. So we have an infinite amount of vectors here that are all perpendicular to the line. And that is also true the other way around. If we would, for example, say we create an implicit equation now of a line by specifying a position of the line with a support vector and then making a normal vector, there is an infinite amount of vectors that are at the right angle to this one. So we don't know, does our line point in this direction? Does it point in this direction or in this one? There is no way how we can specify this with just this one normal vector. It works in 2D because in 2D there, is only, there are only two options and both of them are in the same direction or the opposite direction of course, but uh, in 3D there is an infinite amount, so this is not useful as a definition of a line in 3D. But the parametric equation is because this one vector gives us a unique specification of the direction. Good, another example is uh, the, uh, so there are there of course uh, a lot of other examples, a line is the most straightforward 
there are a lot of other nice things you can do. Um, this is an example I tried to draw it here to illustrate it, where we have uh, three functions. X is the cosine of t, y is the sine of t, and z is just t. So this is x, where we have the cosine function. So this is the x coordinate. Then in the y coordinate, we have the sine function. So this is the, the y. And then, of course, this must be the set direction. So if we combine these two here, we get what, fortunately, a student made in this nice uh, little animation, which hopefully makes it much clearer. If we increase the t value, set increases stepwise, cosine and sine, uh, the, the x and the y move in a 3D space depending on the sine and the cosine in these planes here. And the result is, of course, a nice spiral shape that we get. Yeah, so you see it here. Good. Yeah, that illustrates it much nicer than the slides. Good, so uh, we know now how to represent different shapes in our space, 2D and 3D. Um, and when we want to do graphics with them, uh, of course we can draw them, but there's also one thing that is very important in graphics, which is to calculate the intersection of these objects. And this is of course very important in ray tracing, which I mentioned shortly at the beginning and which we'll cover in detail at the end of the lecture. Um, where I said in ray tracing, we do not like with the projective methods, take the object and project it towards the observer and then draw the projected image on the screen, but we choose basically the other, point, uh, the other way around. We look from the observer towards the screen and then we ask what color does this pixel have by following the ray and then drawing the first object that is hit by the ray. So we need to calculate the intersection of this ray with the object or with an object to specify if it is uh, in a pixel or not. Now you can say, of course, yeah, well, I'm a game student, I'm only interested in games and ray tracing or projective methods are more used in games, so uh, I don't care. But uh, everything is important here, so you should care about everything. Because also in games we have the situation very often that we need intersection tests, which is mostly for interaction. So for example, if you have a shooter game or a game where you have to collect certain things and you click somewhere on the screen, you have to know, of course, at which object am, am I clicking. And this clicking or this shooting here is basically you go through the pixel and then you have to continue to see, okay, it intersects with that sphere. So this is the object that has to blow up if I'm shooting at it or not if I miss it. Good. And uh, yeah, we'll talk about these intersection tests after the break. Mm -hmm.